Well, welcome once again to New King Church. If you're a guest with us, I just want to say you are so welcome here. We're glad that you're here. Uh, my name's Ben. I'm a pastor here at New King. And um, if you do not have a Bible, we would love to get one in your hand. We're going to be just really digging into God's Word. So if you want to slip your hand up, there's people in the back with Bibles, and they'll uh, have one drop in your lap. You can follow along in John. Um, if, you're, if you are here and you are seeking to explore what Christianity is all about, you want to know who Jesus is, I just want to say you are in the right place, um, and we are glad that you're here. This is a place, a safe place for you to uh, just explore what, what Christianity is and who Jesus is. That's why we exist. Um, if, if you don't know us yet, my wife, uh, she was up here, well, she's back there now, is Tiffany, and uh, she's pregnant. We have, uh, if you couldn't tell, she didn't have a big breakfast this morning. Um, we have four kids, and yes, we know we figured out how that works. You don't have to explain. Um, we have a number five on the way uh, in just a few weeks. If, what you may not know <coughs> is that five kids was not our idea. Um, and, and I want to explain that and uh, the story of how God um, brought us to the place to where now we're having five kids. It, um, it applies to what we're going to be learning today, so I just want to kind of share that story with you. So last year, um, my wife had a dream, and in her dream, the Lord came to her and told her that he had something he wanted her to do. And um, she said, yes, Lord, anything. And um, the Lord then told her, I want you to have another baby. She was shocked, um, but her response to that was, okay, Lord, if that's, if that's what you want, then okay. And um, she, in the dream, immediately she was pregnant and she, she woke up. Well, she didn't tell me about the dream for uh, about a week, week and a half. She prayed about it, thought about it, um, pondered these things in her heart. And, uh, and, and then she decided to come and talk to me about it. And when she told me about the dream, I immediately remembered that roughly a week prior, possibly even this, I'd had a dream that, um, that we were pregnant. My dream wasn't as dramatic as hers. I just simply found out that we were pregnant with our fifth child, and I was shocked, and then the dream was over. I woke up. So immediately, we, um, we had this sense that God was speaking. Uh, we had the confirmation from both of us, which is how he had spoken to us many times before. <clears throat> he spoke to us both about the same thing separately to confirm it. And so um, naturally, we felt like this is, uh, this is God. And, and then my immediate response was... Um, Let's pray about it a little bit more. Um, you know, that's the spiritual response if you aren't ready to obey. Uh, let me just pray about that a little bit longer. And so a couple of weeks turned into a month, you know, and Tiffany would come to me. Hey, you praying about that? Yeah, praying about that. Uh, praying about what kind of car we would have to get and where we would live, how we would fit five kids in the house, praying about it. And then a month turned into two months, and she came to me, you know, hey, still, still praying about that? Uh, not, not so much, you know, occasionally, a little bit. And then turned into three months, and then to four, and then five, and then six, seven, eight months goes by. By this point, I'm not really praying about it a whole lot. I, in fact, it has completely left my mind. And uh, this is 
it's really cool. God doesn't forget things. <laughs> we might, you know, and, and we might drift off, and he is still in hot pursuit. So um, I, I completely had, you know, quit praying about this, and, um, and my mom calls me one day, and she says, hey, this is weird, but <clears throat> I had this dream, you were in it, and I feel like maybe uh, it, it, it has some meaning. She says, in the dream, you were a kid, you were playing baseball, and I was in the stands watching, and the only other people in the stands watching were your grandparents, and all my grandparents have passed away. And she says, I could only see you in the batter's box, and, and she said, the, the umpire wasn't down on the field like normal. He was up, in a, up, up above the field in some kind of a stand, speaking down. And I wouldn't, she said, she said, you wouldn't get into the batter's box. You kept, you know, messing around, knocking the dirt off of your cleats or fixing your, your gloves or whatever. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't get into the batter's box. And the umpire says, hey, son, step up to the plate. And I wouldn't do it. And she says, and then he says, son, if you don't step up to the plate, you're going to be out. And, and she says, he calls me out. And then she pleads with the umpire, give him one more chance. And the umpire says, fine, one more chance. And then I step up to the plate. So she says, that was the dream. I don't know if it has any meaning. Well, guys, this is how dense I had become. I said, I don't, I don't know. I don't think it means anything, but I'll pray about it. <laughs> That's just plain embarrassing. So, thanks. <laughs> so, um, about two days later, that was a Saturday, I had set aside the day to pray and fast, specifically because I felt like the power had gone away from my ministry. I, I felt like when I preached, there wasn't power. I felt like when I was dis meeting people to disciple them, there wasn't power, there wasn't effectiveness in my ministry, and I didn't know why. So I set this day aside just to pray and fast and seek God about this. So about halfway through the day, I'm praying, and I'm on my knees begging God, God, return your power to me. What's going on? I'll do anything. How come you, your power is left, your anointing is left, or whatever it is? You know, I, I don't know how to explain it, but something's not right. The effectiveness isn't there. What is it, God? I'll do anything. And he says, actually, I already asked you to do something, and you didn't do it. And I was like, what? And he says, yeah, I asked you to do something eight months ago, and you haven't done it. I said, oh, yeah, that. Forgot about that. And he says, when you obey me in that, then the power will return. Well, fortunately, not only did he correct me, but he also changed my heart. And right then in that moment, the power came to obey. My heart changed. I, I was empowered by the command. And, and I knew this is good. This is wonderful. This is not a burden. This is not a barrier to life. This is a good blessing that God wants to give. And my whole, my whole heart towards another baby changed. And I was excited and I got up, and I went and told Tiffany about it. And um, so we obeyed the Lord, and we were pregnant immediately. Um, God spoke to me through 1 Samuel 15, 22. He said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. God was saying to me, son, it doesn't matter how many sermons you preach, or how many people you disciple, or how many people you share the good news with, if you don't obey what I told you to do. 
To obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. In our passage today in John 2, you may have noticed Mary tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. And they do. And that's what we're going to z- zero in on in this morning's message. Um, because I have learned when I don't do whatever he tells me, then I stop his work in my life. I stop his power from flowing in my life. Our obedience to the Lord, though mine was delayed, released his power. And there's a little baby right here to prove it. This story this morning is about what is possible if we will do whatever he tells us. And before we we dive into it, let me pray one more time. Heavenly Father, oh, I thank you for your patience. I thank you that uh, you give us second chances and third chances. And oh, Lord, I'm so thankful for that. Your grace is astonishing. And um, I pray, Father, this morning that we would be encouraged with right motives to do whatever you tell us and that we would see your power released in our lives as a result. Make our hearts soft. In Jesus' name, amen. So John tells us why he is writing this book. In John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John is saying these specific things are written down Because I want you to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And this this first miracle that Jesus performs, this first sign, turning water into wine, is one of the things that John says, "This this is going to help you believe that he is the Son of God. Um. It is a sign miracle. So it's a, sign, it's, a, it's a miracle with a message that Jesus is performing here. Um, it says, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. So this is a wedding celebration, a Jewish wedding celebration. It's in full swing. Um, and everything on the surface looks fine. But underneath the surface, there's trouble, we find out. They've run out of wine. Wine was a a very important part of a wedding celebration. It was symbolic. Wine was symbolic of joy in Jewish culture. And so they're they're out of wine before the celebration is over. We don't know how much time is left in the celebration, but they're concerned about this. And somehow or another, Mary finds out. It would have been shameful in their culture. This is a shame-based culture. It would have been shameful for them to run out of wine before the celebration's over. So the servants are stressed. Everything looks good on the outside, but underneath there's turmoil. And so, so Mary finds out, and, um, and she lets Jesus know. Now, I don't think she is expecting Jesus to do a miracle. This is, I believe, his first miracle. That's the way that it reads. This, he did the first sign. I think, though, that all growing up with Jesus in the house, that Jesus became the problem solver. He he, he was the most wise person that ever walked the planet, right? Right? And and Mary, we, we, we don't know what happened to Joseph, but he is gone out of the picture. He probably died a premature death. He Uh, We know he's around when Jesus is 12 and he gets lost at the temple. But then after that, we don't we don't hear about him again. He's out of the picture. And Jesus, being the oldest of the siblings, he would have 
been, he would have become the man of the house. And I believe that, that Mary learned, hey, when there's a problem, we go ask Jesus because he's going to solve it for us. I think he would, he would have the right answer for all of the problems. I don't think she's expecting a miracle, but I think she is expecting Jesus to help the, these people out of their conundrum. So she says, hey, Jesus, um, they're out of wine. It's interesting. You have to imagine the kind of, uh, the kind of stress that these servants are under. They're trying to keep it cool. They're trying to not let everyone know what's going on. Maybe, maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you're trying to keep it cool on the surface. But underneath the surface, there's turmoil. You're thinking, and maybe you've told someone close to you, I just don't know how I'm going to keep going. I just, uh, I'm not sure that this is working. I'm not sure how much longer the finances are going to stretch. I'm not sure how much longer the way I'm doing life is going to work. And, and so what I want to say to you is that we're going to see that when you're in that position, if you will hand things over to Jesus, he can do great things. He can, be, he can meet your need. He can provide for you where you have lack. He is willing to help us in our desperate situations. But how? How does he help? That's the question. So his mother said to the servants, verse 5, do whatever he tells you. How does Jesus help? Well, he solves our problems by taking full charge of the situation. And that's the only way. He must be totally in charge in order to solve our problems. That's why Mary says, do whatever he tells you. It's like by this point in her life, she had recognized if Jesus is going to solve the problem, you've got to do it exactly his way. And so she says, do whatever he tells you. This is the big takeaway that I want you to get this morning, and then there's going to be sub points to this. But obedience to Jesus, complete obedience to him, unleashes his power in our lives. That's the big takeaway. And then we're going to look at sub points to that. Um, this is seen throughout the gospel accounts of Jesus's life. Now, I mean, a good example is Jesus is walking on the water, across the water, and, and the disciples are in the boat in the storm, and they see Jesus. And, and what does Peter say to Jesus? Lord, if that's you, command me to come out. Command me. He needs the command. But when he gets the command and he obeys the command, it unleashes the power of of Jesus in his life, and he's able to walk on the water. He needs the command. The power to obey is in the command given. Jesus sitting with his disciples at the Last Supper before he's arrested and crucified, you see this common theme running throughout that conversation with his disciples. In John 14, 15, and 16, it says, he says to them, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So there's the obedience and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Now there's the power. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. There's the obedience. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. There's the power. 15.7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. There's the obedience. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. There's the power. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Obedience, power. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And then he goes on to say, 
you are no longer servants but friends because I have commanded because I have told you all that the Father has told me. But listen to this one, John 14, 21 says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. So there's the obedience. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Who does he manifest himself to? The one who obeys. Who does his power flow to? The one who obeys his commands. This is not talking about his approval, or, or this is not talking about acceptance. This is talking about his power. This is talking about answers to prayer. This is talking about the spirit being provided to you in response to your obedience to the command. So there is a clear connection in all of these verses between loving him, those who love him, obey him, Those who obey him see his power unleashed. Now, because of this truth, I want us to settle three things in our hearts ahead of time. This morning, I want to talk about three things that we need to settle in our hearts today so that we can go from here and do whatever he tells us. Number one, I want us to settle it in our hearts that we will do whatever he tells us exactly as he tells us. Um, That might seem like a small detail, but it's very important. So Mary has, like I said, probably learned her lesson that this has to be done just as he wants it done, and so she tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. Not, hey, Jesus is going to help you guys. He's going to help you guys find a solution. Uh, hey, see, Jesus is going to, you know, Jesus is going to see if you can find some more wine. No. She knows, she's learned that Jesus has got to take full charge. It's got to be done exactly as he says. And so he tells them, go fill six stone jars. They don't go fill five. They don't fill them up halfway. They fill them up completely. Right? Um, We read the same kinds of things throughout the Gospels. He gives specific instructions, and they must be followed exactly. There's one time where the disciples have been fishing all night long. They don't catch anything, nothing. And he says, hey, throw your net out on the other side of the boat. And you've got to imagine, like, the, the confusion right there. The other side of the boat? You've been, that's like a, you know, a six foot difference. But they do it. And the the net is filled with more fish than they can pull up. There's another time where they have to pay a temple tax. And Jesus tells one of the disciples to go throw a line into the water. The fish that you catch will have a coin in its mouth. Take the coin and pay your tax and mine with it. What? That's crazy. But it happens, and they, and they go, and they obey exactly as he said, and his power is unleashed. Another time he says, go into the city. You're going to find a man with a jar on his head, and he's going to have. I mean, this, these, these crazy instructions, Right? And they follow them, and when they do, exactly as he says, his power is unleashed. So what has he told you to do that you haven't done exactly as he said? Has he said to end that relationship, and you haven't done it? Maybe you backed off a bit, but you haven't done it exactly as he said. Or... He has told you to guard your eyes from evil, but some movies are just too good. Or maybe he said, do not cross the line with alcohol, but you keep playing with that line a little bit here and there. Or maybe he said, make the best use of your time. 
But, you know, you're not going to throw away your video games. You're not going to get rid of your Facebook account. I mean, because who does that, right? Or maybe he has said, don't worry about anything. But you think, well, but is that really a sin that he cares that much about? Or maybe he's told you to forgive someone, and you keep picking that offense back up. So what is it that he has asked you to do that you need to do exactly as he said? Um, Sometimes we forget the basic truths of the Bible. The basics of the Bible are that God wants your whole life. He wants all of you. He doesn't want just to be added on to your life like, you know, Jesus helps me out a bit when I need it. That's not how this works. He wants your whole life. He wants to transform your life. He wants to give you an abundant life, a full life. But in order for that to happen, he's got to have all of your life. It, go, it changes our thinking from, you know, this is my life and God is a great addition. He helps me out a bit to, I wonder what God has planned for my life. I can't wait to see what he wants to do with my life. See the difference? So when you give him your life, when you do exactly as he tells you, amazing things will happen in you and around you. The kingdom of heaven will break in You will see his power begin to flow into your situations. The second thing that we need to settle before we leave here today is that we need to do whatever he tells us to do, even if it's not logical. This is a big one. This is a really big one. And I'll just tell you, this is what got me with baby number five. And, and, and this is something I have preached for years, and it still got me. I still slipped into it. I, I know this intellectually, but this is hard. We're, we're trained to think and make our decisions and, and be ruled by logic. And I'm not saying that God isn't logical, but sometimes we can't see his logic. You see what I mean? Sometimes we have very limited perspective. Right. And so for me, I'm going five kids is not logical. I mean, God, you know how much money I make. You know how how expensive it is to live here. You know what our life is like, the craziness of four kids. You know how busy we are. You know all these things, God, this is not logical. You must not have said that. And see, logic got in the way of me seeing something very, very clear that God was saying. But if you read the Bible, one time I read through the Gospel of Mark, and I just, I stopped every single time I saw Jesus making a decision. Every single time, and I said, okay, I put myself in that same situation. And I asked myself, in that same exact situation, would I have made the decision he made? Ruled by logic? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Not one of the decisions that he made. I wouldn't have made the same decision being ruled by logic. What was he being ruled by? The voice of the Father. He says, I don't speak on my own authority, but the words that the Father tells me to speak, I say. The works that I do are not my own, but my father's. He was obeying. And and because he was obeying, his life didn't look logical. This will set you free right here. If you are bound up by logic, you cannot, you cannot do all that God wants you to do. You need to recognize that sometimes God is going to ask you to do things that everyone around you is going to look at and say, that was stupid. And all you've got is, Lord, I, just, I know I'm obeying you. 
I know for a fact you told me to do this. I'm following you. I don't care if it looks logical. You told me to do it. This was not logical. These, these servants are supposed to be finding wine. They're busy filling up six giant stone jars, 20 to 30 gallon stone jars, and they didn't have a water hose. I don't know how they had to do it, buckets probably from a well, but they, it took some time. And here they are in the middle of a crisis, and they're filling up jars with water. They could have easily said, okay, thanks for your help, Jesus, but we don't need water. We're good on water. We need wine. Right? He didn't tell him what he was going to do. Did you see that? He just says, go fill up these jars with water. That's how he likes to work. He likes to get you to do the thing before you know why you're doing the thing. <laughs> because that takes faith. Because that stretches your faith. That tests your trust. And so he, he asks us to do things that don't feel logical. Jesus was not led by logic. So, instead of asking yourself, is it logical? Ask yourself, what is God saying? Some of you know that God has already told you to stop watching TV or Netflix or both, but that's not logical. Some of you, God has asked you to change jobs, but that's not logical. Some of you, God has been prompting you to talk to somebody about your faith. You haven't done it yet because it's not logical. Some of you, I'm going to, this might be a tender spot. God has told you to get off social media. Because, y'all, this is one of our biggest issues in society right now. We are distracted to death. We are losing our souls over social media, over the internet, over distraction. We are commanded to pray without ceasing, to walk by the Spirit, to give thanks in all circumstances. And it is impossible to do that when you're like this. You know? When do we pray? Because in every down moment, we turn to the phone. Some of you remember a time when you would be standing in line, and the only thing you could do was look around. <laughs> we used to, we had a word for it. We had a word for it back in the early 2000s. It was, it was called boredom. And we were just fine with it. I'm kidding, but y'all, this is serious. A real issue. I, I feel like doing like an entire, we need to do a whole series on this. We are distracting ourselves to death. Our souls are like an inch deep. We have all the information in the world available to us in our pockets, and we're losing our souls. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Anyway, that was a side point. Some of you, God has asked you to get off social media altogether, but that's not logical. Some of you, God has asked you to get up earlier so you can spend time with him. But you know you're going to be tired. And that's not logical. So instead of asking, does it make sense? We need to simply ask, what would you have me do? Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Don't you want friendship with him? The third thing we need to settle in our minds this morning is we need to do whatever he tells us, even if it's risky. Even if it's risky. Now, this may not be apparent at first, but what these servants are doing here was risky. I don't know when he turned the water into wine, but I don't think he did it until they're carrying the water to the master of the uh, 
of the wedding. It says, again, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. He doesn't say, now draw some of the wine out. They just filled it up with water. And he says, now draw some out. I think it's still water. I think they're, they're carrying a cup of water, like splashing it like this. <laughs> up to the master of the feast. And in the process, maybe they hand it to the guy. <laughs> and, and when he gets it, it's wine. But whatever the case, Jesus asks them to stop doing whatever their other responsibilities are, to trust him completely, and to spend however much time it's going to take to fill up six stone jars with 20 to 30 gallons of water. And then draw some out, go to the master of the feast, and just trust me, it's going to be all right. Jesus asks us to do risky things. He's going to ask you to do some risky things. Some of you, God's going to put a calling on your life to go to an unreached people group. You're not going to stick around here. You're not going to live out the American dream and save up as much money as you can save. You're actually, God's actually going to completely change the direction of your life. And you're going to go to an unreached people group. You're going to go and learn a new language. That's not logical, and it's not safe. But it's going to be amazing. He asks us to do risky things because it requires our total trust. Remember, he sends out the disciples two by two, and he says, he says, go, but don't take any money with you. Don't take a bag. Don't pack a bag. Don't take an extra tunic. Don't take extra sandals. In other words, I want, I want your only safety net to be me. He loves to stretch us. He loves to ask us to do things that feel risky. He calls people to leave their careers and give their lives to gospel proclamation in unreached places. He does. He calls people to give away their life savings. He calls people to speak up in their workplace when it might mean losing their job. He calls families to relocate to cities and towns that need a gospel witness. He calls families to have more kids than they think they can handle. He calls us to do things, guys, that feel risky. But when we obey in spite of the risk, God honors our risk-taking faith. This is one of the reasons that we made pioneering one of our values here at New King. So we have four values here, friendship with Jesus, hospitality, depth in the word, and pioneering. And this is why we made this one of our four values. We know that every, I mean, almost, almost every time there is a command given to someone, it requires a risk. And if we're going to reach our cities, if we're going to reach our state, if we're going to reach our region with the gospel, it's going to require us taking some big risks. We got to be willing to step out we got to be willing to actually fail even. Like we're going to try some things sometimes that, we don't, that don't work. And it's okay. We're going to say, okay, that didn't work. We'll try something else. If we're afraid of failure, we'll never step out. Don't, don't let fear of failure keep you from doing what Jesus is asking you to do. We believe God is going to ask us as a church to take some big risks. We, he's already asked us to take some risks. We believe he's going to keep asking us to take some big risks for the sake of the gospel. The gospel is worth it. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is the good news about Jesus. Jesus is the son of God. In order to understand the good news, first you've got to know the bad news. And the bad news is that all people, all of us, we have rebelled and turned away from God and gone our own way. And it's called sin. And the penalty of sin, God declared in the very first pages of the Bible, is death. He is a holy and just and perfect God. 
And so sin separates us from him who is life. And when we sin, we are separated from him. And the, the result is all of the death and the chaos and the pain and the brokenness that you see in this world and in your own life. And the good news about Jesus is that he's made a way for us to be healed, for us to be restored, for us to be forgiven for our rebellion against God and returned to relationship, reconciled with our creator God. And when we're reconciled with him and united back with him, we get life again. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know you and your son whom you sent. Eternal life is a relationship. Look, this is what we are about here. This isn't about trying to get to heaven one day. This is about a relationship with the God who made you now and for eternity. The good news is that Jesus came and made a way by dying on the cross for our sins. See, the penalty for our sin was death. And Jesus said, I'll take the penalty. And only he could do it because he was the perfect man. He'd never sinned. So he wasn't dying for his own sins. He was dying for ours. When he hung on the cross, he took our sins on himself. He took the wrath of God on himself. And he died. He paid the price in full. And he was buried. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. And he declared to all, he declared to all that if, if we would put our trust in him, if we would believe in him, we would be forgiven. And we could have a relationship with God. We could be friends with God through him. That's the good news. And if you haven't believed it, I want to invite you to believe it this morning. You can begin that relationship with God this morning, today, by simply saying, God, I admit that I am a sinner. I have rebelled against you. I've done life my own way with no regard for you. And I am sorry, and I want to go your way. I want to follow Jesus. I want to trust him. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose for me. And he will forgive you, and he will give you new life. And if you're already a Christian here this morning, but you've not been obeying the Lord's instructions to you because they weren't logical, or you've been sort of obeying, but not exactly as he told you, you can turn to him again this morning. Every time I look at my pregnant wife, I am reminded that even after you disobey, he gives you another chance. What's he telling you to do that you've been ignoring? It might feel extreme. It might not be logical. And it might require taking a risk. Maybe you've hardened your heart like I did for eight months because you didn't obey at first. Maybe there's a hidden sin you're refusing to take drastic steps to repent of. Or maybe you don't even know what instruction you've ignored, just like I was. You don't even, you, you've hardened your heart to the point you don't even know what it is. You just know there's distance. We're just going to take some time right now to pray and ask God if there's anything that he's asked us to do that we haven't done. And just lay it all before the Lord who sees it all. Let's be a people who are willing to do whatever he tells us so that he can he can pour out his power in our lives because he's worth it. Let's let's pray as the band comes back up. Let's just take some time to pray. And seek God to show us our hearts.
you don't know what to pray, just pray, Holy Spirit, search me and know me and see if there is any wicked way in me. Father, we we shut your voice out so often. The truth is, Father, we love to be distracted because it keeps us from having to face the truth sometimes. And we, we love to keep the noise going in our heads. God, because if, if we get in too much silence, it scares us. God, we don't, we don't know what you might ask us to do. We don't know what you might ask us to repent of, and we're afraid of that sometimes. So, Father, just from the bottom of our hearts, we want to just declare the truth that you are worth obeying. That it is better that we listen to your voice than that we make a bunch of sacrifices. So, Father, would you help us? Help us to know whatever it is that you're asking us to do. Help us, Father, to obey exactly as you tell us even if it isn't logical and even if it requires great risk because you're worth it because Jesus is worth it in his name we pray amen